Growing up here in North Carolina, I spent much of my childhood playing with the animals in my backyard. My twin sister Julia and I would raise tadpoles and go swimming with the frogs. We would build bird houses out of gourds and feed the squirrels blueberry muffins. And to this day, we give them endearing names like Alan after the hangover character for a certain squirrel's habit of getting himself stuck in our gutters. Fast forward to the summer after my first year at Duke, when I was inspired to apply this curiosity for the natural world to a career in science. Eager to join the research community and drive the advancement of science, I began my search for a lab. However, I felt one thing holding me back from truly embracing this newfound passion for scientific research. Something unexpected my conscience. Conducting research on animals felt wrong. I couldn't imagine giving a mouse that I had raised a terminal disease or euthanizing a rabbit simply because it was no longer useful to my research. I became discouraged that I might have to compromise my love of animals to work in the perfect lab. That is, until I found the Musa lab. At the Musa Lab, we recognize the need for novel preclinical testing platforms that are more ethical, more physiologically relevant to the human body, and more cost-effective, with the belief that animal models will soon be replaced by more advanced technologies. As part of this lab, I could work on creating the solution to the ethical concern that I had grappled with firsthand. And it was in my third year of working in this lab that I was truly able to witness the direct impact of my research. You may remember from my childhood picture that I have a twin sister. So when my research mentor, Dr. Rohan Bhattacharya, came to me with a project where I could work on improving treatments for twin girls at Duke Hospital, I jumped at the opportunity. This project proposed by Dr. Samira Musa herself and one of our collaborators, Dr. Jensen Hall, would help patients of Dr. Hall's who had been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease at just nine years old due to a novel mutation in their DNA. Kidney disease impacts more than one in 10 people around the world and is also a top 10 cause of death due to its limited treatment options. Despite treatment with a common kidney disease drug, the girl's kidney function had not recovered, as evidenced by persistently high levels of protein in their urine. To make matters even worse, this common kidney disease drug was known to cause toxic side effects in many patients, which could damage their kidneys even further. Now, this situation was shocking to me. Almost like a cruel game of pharmaceutical roulette, the limited treatment options available could be life-saving for some while causing devastating effects in others. Was this really the best medical research had to offer? The answer lies in a law created about a century ago, the FDA Act of 1938. This was a reactionary law born out of tragedy. Due to the lack of toxicity testing, before a novel antibiotic was distributed to the population, over 100 patients died in a mass poisoning. At the time, animals were our best option to replicate human drug response. So the law mandated that new drugs first be tested in animals during preclinical trials, and only then tested in humans during clinical trials. Since the passage of this law, chimpanzees, man's closest relatives, have been subject to brain damage, castration, disease, and death, all in the name of science. It took 77 years for the NIH to finally revoke its support for the use of chimpanzees in biomedical research. Yet, if research on chimpanzees for the advancement of medicine is unacceptable. Why do we feel comfortable with these same experiments being conducted in other primates, mice 
and even man's best friend. Animal models will soon be outdated for modeling human drug response. In fact, out of every 10 drugs that succeed in animal preclinical testing, only one makes it through clinical trials. And out of the 10% that do make it through, they don't work for every patient. This is because the inbred mouse models that are often used in preclinical testing are almost completely genetically identical. We should instead be testing new drugs on a platform that is representative of human genetic diversity and can account for the widely different drug responses experienced by different people. Exclusive reliance on animal models for preclinical testing not only wastes animal lives and puts clinical trial patients at risk, but it also contributes to the inhibitory costs of pharmaceuticals and slows down potentially life-saving therapeutic development. On average, it takes about a billion dollars in 12 years of pharmaceutical research and development to bring a new drug to market. Meanwhile, experts estimate that in just five years, novel preclinical testing platforms could reduce the cost of pharmaceutical development by 20%, and the time spent in preclinical trials by over 10%. For the past century, modernizing preclinical trials has been an impossible dream due to the 1938 Act and other similar FDA regulations. However, new legislation has just been passed with the FDA Modernization Act 2.0 that is set to revolutionize preclinical trials as we know them today. This act recognizes new preclinical testing platforms, many of which are being developed right now, right here at Duke, as viable replacements for animal models. One of these platforms is an organ on a chip. My research at the Musa Lab specifically focuses on a type of organ on a chip called a kidney on a chip, developed by Dr. Samira Musa herself. These 3D culture devices are so small, they can fit in the palm of your hand. In fact, I have one right here in my pocket. And yet this device, no bigger than a flash drive, can replicate the full function of your kidneys. Our devices utilize microfluidics, which means they contain tiny channels similar in scale to your kidney tissues. We line these channels with the patient's stem cells and flow certain fluids and molecular cues in them to encourage the stem cells inside to grow and mature into kidney tissues. Our devices contain two channels, a urinary and a capillary channel, to replicate the filtration function that is created by the interaction between these two different tissue types in a real kidney. In the lab, we personalized these kidneys on chips to our patients at Duke Hospital and tested a variety of different drugs on these platforms in order to find better treatments for the girls. Our results have been astounding. Not only were we able to replicate similar symptoms as seen in our patients in these kidneys on chips, but we were also able to find a drug combination that improved the disease phenotype and I hope that this could change the lives of the girls at Duke Hospital, allowing them to be kids again. Who knows? Maybe they like to play with the animals in their backyard just like me. And these organs on chips aren't only helpful for kidney disease patients. In fact, it was recently discovered that had drugs been tested on livers on chips prior to use in clinical trials, hundreds of lives lost to drug-induced liver injury could have been saved. And these single organ models are just the beginning. Already under development are bodies on chips, which combine multiple different organs on chips to replicate a full body response. Just imagine your whole body on a chip. Despite all these advancements, there still remain some practicality concerns when looking at applying these organs on chips to industry. For instance, 
Workflow changes and technical training required may need a large investment before profits are realized. In addition, a lot of work remains to scale up the manufacturing and operation of these devices to address the thousands of candidates in drug screenings. In addition, there remains some hesitation around the reliability of these devices. I know from working with these chips firsthand that something as minuscule as a tiny air bubble can completely derail the whole experiment. Yet, collaborations between industry and academia are already beginning to overcome these challenges. One recent collaboration of note is between the pharmaceutical company Pfizer, known for the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, and the organ on a chip company, Draper. This collaborative research team was able to test over 96 different organ models in one chip. Actually, in one culture plate. And personally, in my role after, as a consultant after graduation, I hope to help academia and industry ensure that these platforms are not just promising in the lab, but also transformative in the lives of patients. To truly affect change, we will need support from patients and clinical trial participants who should expect nothing but the best technologies when it comes to their health. If you're tired of hearing the laundry list of side effects at the e end of every pharmaceutical commercial, it's time to celebrate the advancement of medicine towards a platform that is more personalized and inclusive. And finally, I ask you, my fellow researchers, to consider whether there's a better way to conduct your research. I am so grateful that the ethical dilemma I faced in my freshman year brought me to the Musa Lab. Yet animal lovers like me shouldn't have to avoid a lab based on its research methods. It is time that we stand up for preclinical testing that is more ethical more physiologically relevant, and more cost-effective. Let's usher in a new era of organs on chips, not chimps. Thank you.